the origin of all of this is a comment that Pete Buttigieg made in the CNN town hall that happened with all the Democrat candidates earlier this week. And here's what he said. They were asking him a question about his faith, and he's, I think, Episcopalian, if I'm saying that correctly. I think he's Episcopalian in any way. That's a church that somewhat embraces the gay lifestyle and doesn't really think of it as a sin. And so because of that, uh, he's somebody that is saying that he is a faithful follower of Christ, despite the fact that he's also homosexual and he doesn't really think of it as a sin, even though, according to the scripture, it is. And his response to that question was, I get one of these things about scripture. Sorry, I get that one of the things about scripture is different people see it different things in it. But at the very least, we should be able to establish that God does not have a political party. Now, I'll say this. Like all convincing lies, this one is half true. Just like every lie that has a chance of ensnaring people, there is at least a a little bit of truth contained within it. Because the larger implication here is that different people see Scripture different ways, and your way is just as good as my way, and we'll just kind of figure it out, and we'll just live the way we want to. And really, any of the interpretations of Scripture are okay with God, because Scripture can be seen many different ways. Scripture can't be seen many different ways. It can be seen incorrectly, and it can be seen correctly. But let's not pretend as though any interpretation of Scripture is just open for debate. Peter himself said that Scripture is not open to private interpretation. There is a correct way to read Scripture and an incorrect way to see Scripture. And this is, oddly enough, something that in our very secularized world, people seem to have a hard time understanding. There is an intended message and a a way that that message is supposed to be understood and reacted to. For example, you see a stop sign on the road. The intended message is stop. Now, if you get pulled over for running a stop sign and you tell the police officer, well, you know, a stop sign can be seen so many different ways. There there are different people that see different things in stop signs. Well, yeah, but there's also the correct and legal way to see a stop sign, which is you stop your car. You see, that's the message being conveyed, correctly understood by the person, and then acted upon. That's the way this is supposed to go. The Bible is much the same way. When the Bible says stop, when it says this is something that is sinful and harmful to you, and you don't need to be engaged in it, then the correct response is to understand that message and stop doing what you're doing. I mean, yes, you could theoretically interpret a stop sign to mean gun it, but that is not the intended message, nor is it the appropriate response to said message. And that's really where this is getting caught up. Now, does God have a political party? This is the true aspect of this. No. No. And people ask me about this all the time, and and I have people that actually get mad and, and don't like it when I talk about this. God is not an overtly political being. In fact, we see many times in the biblical narrative, Jesus specifically going out of his way to avoid getting caught up in politics. You'll see the question where he's asked about taxation. That was primarily a political question. Now, it had a spiritual answer to it, in the sense that God is, or that Jesus responds to say, look, it, it bears the mark of Caesar. You give to Caesar what is due him. You give to God what is due him. That was a spiritual answer to a political question. And those happen sometimes. But the point is, it was a political question. And what they were trying to do is get him caught up in the politics of the day. They were trying to get Jesus Christ to take a stance on Roman occupation. Are you going to be somebody that opposes Rome or somebody that is in favor of Rome, a worldly government? The same is true when the Greeks wanted to take him off and and basically make him their king there in Athens. And Jesus is like, "Uh, no thanks. Jesus had the opportunity to be a worldly king. He could have raised up a worldly army, a worldly kingdom, and established his kingdom here on earth. He didn't do that because he has a spiritual kingdom which is made without hands. He told Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus went out of his way to avoid 
getting caught up in politics because that was not his mission. And when it comes to political matters, it is 100% true that there are a lot of political situations and political matters that I don't think God is overly concerned with. For example, as strongly as I feel about taxation, I don't think that God has a preferred tax plan. I would really like a flat tax. I don't think that God is upset with me for wanting a flat tax, nor do I think that he would praise me for wanting a flat tax. I see it as something that's fair. I think that it's political advanta- politically advantageous. I don't think God really has an opinion on that. Or that he's at least not concerned enough about it that it would in any way affect my spiritual well-being. Abortion, on the other hand, is a question that has been very political, and there is a correct and an incorrect spiritual response to that because of the rules and laws that God has given us in his word. The same could be true of homosexuality. There are a lot of issues that the Bible actually speaks on, and I do think that the way that we vote and the policy position that we have on some of those issues, that does matter to God. Because if we are living in the world and openly condoning a sin through the political process or using politics by saying, well, God wouldn't have an opinion on this because it's politics, ergo, I can just do what I want to on this one issue. No, that's that's not how this works. God does have an opinion on some political issues, but only because of their spiritual implications, because that is what he, he is chiefly concerned with. And so because of that, this is a, a, a very carefully crafted lie that falls apart when faced with even the, sl- the slightest amount of scrutiny. The aspect of truth in it is that God doesn't have a political party. I don't think that God is going to be pleased with you or condemn you for voting Republican or Democrat or e- any of those things. But he is going to take issue if you supported evil practices like abortion or slavery or if you refuse to support people that would at least do the best that they could to run the government in a way that is in accordance to God's will. Not necessarily theocracy, not saying that they would run everything according to the Bible, just that they would not do things that would be in contradiction to God's will. We do have a responsibility to support godly candidates, and I think that that's something that the Scripture backs up. And like most Democrats, one of the big problems here is that but a judge wants to take a handful of specifically cherry-picked verses out of context and use them when they are useful to him. And this is I've done countless segments on this. You remember that the MSNBC, when we were talking about the immigration debate, they took a handful of cherry-picked verses specifically out of context and refused the other verses that actually showed the exact opposite of what he was saying, and just used those because they thought it would be useful. I mean, the liberals were reading Bibles on MSNBC. I thought the end time was coming. But a judge is the same way. When he believes that the Bible would benefit him, or there's a part of the Bible that he specifically likes, then he'll kind of drag that out to suit his political agenda, and then ignore the rest of it. It's kind of like, I don't know of a single atheist that can't quote from memory Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest you be judged. Now they stop right there and don't read Matthew 7, 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 because it says the exact opposite of what they're implying when they say judge not lest you be judged, where it actually gives instructions for God's people to judge and how they're supposed to judge. But they want to stop right there at verse 1 and leave it at that. And that's why they'll pull that one verse out of context and try to use it as a shield on a Christian and then put it away and ignore the entire rest of the Bible. That's the kind of religion Pete Buttigieg has. And he says in this this same town hall, this is sort of an example of that. Part of where I'm coming from is a faith tradition that counsels me to be as humble as possible, that counsels me to look after those who need defending. And frankly, It couldn't be more radically different than what I see, certainly in this White House, where there's a a ton of chest thumping and self-aggrandizing, not to mention abusive behavior, but also a political agenda 
that seems to always be revolving around the idea that somehow it's too easy for poor people in this country. It's just so different than what I get when I read scripture. So there it is. That is essentially Pete Buttigieg's depiction of the White House. And it's not wholly inaccurate. Let's be honest, Trump is not exactly a humble human being. He's one of the most arrogant people you will ever run across. And he's not somebody that's super religious or conservative. He himself has said that. That's not even just me commentating. He has said that. And another thing that is important to remember, too, there is some abusive behavior. He's not somebody that would necessarily be easy to work with. If nothing else, the Mueller report did show us that, even though we pretty much already knew that and could tell that if you have even a monicum of common sense and watch this guy on a regular basis. So is his commentary on the Trump White House true? Yeah, I think that there's actually a lot of truth to it. I don't think that he's way off the mark here. But I will point this out. He's saying that in the first part of that, where I'm coming from in my faith tradition, it counsels me to be as humble as possible. I don't think that there's anything more arrogant than somebody that is saying to God, no, Lord, you got that one wrong. And that's essentially what Buddha Judge is doing when he talks about his faith being a part of his homosexuality. He's saying that God got this one wrong. He messed up on the homosexuality question. And his son and his son's disciples, they had the wrong idea on this one. That when it came to that question about what is correct, biblical, godly sexuality and sexual practice, which is to only take place between a married man and a married woman in the confines of marriage, one man, one woman for life. Well, God screwed up on that one. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick out the scriptures that I like and just kind of ignore the ones that I don't. And so I become a priest to myself. And I become the only one that really matters. I'm the one that gets to decide which verses are relevant and which ones aren't. I can't think of anything more arrogant than that. And as arrogant as Donald Trump is, and goodness knows he is, he's never done that. He's never said, I get to decide what parts of God's word I follow and which ones I don't. I think he kind of widely acknowledges that he doesn't follow most of it. And I'm not trying to defend Trump on that. I think that, you know, he is not led anywhere near a pure godly life. But let's not pretend that but a judge is this paramount of virtue when the thing that he's most famous for is taking verses completely out of context and basically pick and choosing and forming his own religion around his feelings and what he thinks ought to be godly living and what really isn't. You see, this kind of thinking is completely counterintuitive. It makes no logical sense. And what he has really done is he has flipped the idea of Christianity on its head. Because the idea of Christianity is that we are wrong and sinful individuals, and we come to Christ for forgiveness. And what happens in that forgiveness process is that he purifies us and sanctifies us, and we change the evil in our life to conform to his will. But a judge's version of religion, and the reason I'm talking so much about this is not even the religious implications, but because there are so many people that have fallen into this folly that we can just make God into whatever we want to. Because that's ultimately what his version of faith does, is instead of changing himself to fit what God wants, he changes God to fit what he wants. He wants to be gay, therefore he changes God into somebody that would approve of homosexuality. He doesn't see a God that commands certain specific things in no uncertain terms in his holy inspired word and sees that as something that is worth taking into consideration when he makes choices for his own life. He is someone that arrogantly says, No, Lord, I know better than you and I know better than your apostles, whom you and your son appointed specifically to give us commands on how we're supposed to live in accordance with your will. 
Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.